Hello, my name is Tariq Osman and this is a review of the book Generation Left by Keir Milburn. This book belongs to a series of ones which were published in the last two, three years trying to look at the phenomenon of the anger of young people the world over. But I think that Keir Milburn adds three or four points to the discussion that are worthy of attention. The first point is that he lays out the picture in front of us in a number of economic statistics. He focuses on four criteria. On salaries, whether they are going up or down. On asset ownership, whether they are going up or down on the availability of pensions and therefore some sort of stability about the future, and access to education, especially university education, higher education, and good health care. In the first part of the book, he shows us these four factors by demographic or age groups. So he basically puts in front of us a picture in which in these four criteria there is a huge difference between those who are 30, 35 years and younger versus those who are 50, 55 and older. And the point, of course, is that in these four criteria those who are 50, 55 and older are doing by far better than those who are young, those who are 35 and younger, all over the world, but with a special focus on Europe. And I think many researchers in particular would find a lot of the numbers that Milburn included in his book very valuable. But the key point that he highlights here is that it is not really about age. Rather, it is about asset ownership. So what he is trying to convince us, the readers, in this first point, is that at the surface it appears as if if you are 25 or 30 then you do not really have a decent income, you do not really have uh, an increase in your income over the past five years or so, your per- the percentage of the people in that segment who own their homes is by far by far lower than those who are 55 and above, and many people will say, but that is normal, that is very natural. In reality, he is trying to show us that if you look at the trends in these four criteria, in the last 20-25 years, there is a huge divergence, not just between age groups, which might be relatively easy to explain and understand, but rather between asset owners. So if you are an asset owner, primarily have property, have investments in stocks, then you have been doing by far better in these four criteria versus those who do not own assets. And that the age group issue is just the surface of it, because people age. So if you look at the data in 85, for example, in 95, in 2005, and then in 2015, 2017, obviously people have moved throughout the age groups. But in reality, the trends of favorableness in these four criteria is by far continuing to become better and better towards those who are asset owners and by far worse to those who do not own assets. So the conclusion of the first point, you might think that young people are angry because they are having poor record in these four points. What you really ought to think about, it's not just a matter of age group, but rather it's asset ownership. Why this is very important? Because obviously it means that if you are today 25 years old, it does not necessarily mean that things will be by far better when you are 35 and then will become rosy when you are 45. If you do not belong to the class of asset owners, then you will continue to suffer this huge difference in these four criteria, these crucial socioeconomic criteria. The second point that Keir Milburn puts forward in this book is more of a political economy context. 
And he's basically saying that in the last 10, 12 years since the financial crisis in 2008, there have been gradual but very clear changes in the social contract, primarily in Europe. So as a result of the financial crisis, the many austerity programs, the reduction in healthcare programs, increasing tuition fees at universities, reforms in employment laws, contraction of pension funds, what have you, different policies, not only have altered the relationship between the state and the people. Many political scientists and political economists have written about that. But more importantly for the argument of this book, these policies have cemented the political economy structure that increases the demarcation between asset owners and non-asset owners in these four macro criteria that I started with. Obviously, this is a very political point because simply it means that the responses to the financial crisis by the political authorities, primarily in the West and especially in Europe, have very much entrenched the system that favor asset owners versus non-asset owners, despite the fact that the crisis was primarily caused by asset owners. This second point in the book, Milburn elaborates upon in, in a lot of detail, actually, to try to convince the readers that it is not really that the issue, the problem, is not really primarily economic inequality, but rather this political economy structure that increases and perpetuates the situation as is. And this leads him to quite an interesting conclusion that if you are an asset owner, then most likely you have an incentive that the situation remains as is, that there are no major changes in the political and the political economy structure that exists today. While if you're young, you're 35 and younger, then you have all the incentives in the world actually to effect major changes in this economic structure, in this political system. And he uses that to explain why in elections all over the West and primarily in Europe in the last 10 years, the voting patterns of those who are 55 and above has always been, in the vast majority of cases, for the perpetuation of the status quo, for things to remain as is, while the voting patterns for those who are 35 years and younger have almost always, and with a huge majority, were for changing the status quo. He also uses this argument to explain the wave of anger that we saw in Europe in the last 10 years or so. So he elaborates a lot actually on the protests that happened in England, in London in particular in 2010, after university tuition fees were raised. He elaborates on the rise of the indignados in Spain in the protests of anger that took place in Greece at roughly the same time, which led to the rise of the uh, Syriza party there. He zooms in on the Occupy movement, which began in Wall Street in, in New York and then came to Europe and was a very clear force in the city of London for a number of months. And though his argument is primarily focused on Europe, he actually shows that the situation and the, the phenomenon is clear the world over. And he links it, for example, to the Arab uprisings, what came to be known as the Arab Spring 2011-2012. And this brings us to the third point, which I think is, is quite important in Keir Milburn's argument in this book. That is, that the anger that was there on the streets in the West, in the UK, in Spain, in Greece, in, we saw in France in the last two years, and in other places, did not remain just unorganized, loose energy. It tried to organize itself, and therefore we saw, as I mentioned, in Greece, Syriza party being formed and actually come to power. We saw in Spain the huge momentum that was given to Podemos. 
we saw the phenomenon of Jeremy Corbyn, who managed to become the leader of the Labour Party. And even if he suffered a huge defeat in December 2019, but that was a colossal change in the structure and the leadership of the Labour Party. We saw major changes in the left in France. And some would argue that even the rise of Macron was, to some extent, based on this organized anger coming to effect change in French politics. We saw the Five Star Movement in Italy, which began with, with basically a clown making jokes on the establishment in Italy, and then within a number of very short number of years become the leading party in government. So in short, what Milburn is trying to say here is that the waves of anger that were clear on the streets, primarily by young people, but in reality by those who are not asset owners and who felt and realized that the political economy structures perpetuate the situation as is, that energy became organized and tried to effect change through political parties in their countries. The fourth point in the book, I think, is the most interesting, that even though that has happened, that the force and the energy of anger did not remain loose on the street and actually was organized, and some of it actually came to power. And yet, despite all of that, the political economy structure did not change. And I think this is a very valuable contribution of this book. Some people will question some of the conclusions that he arrives at in this point. I think some of his deductions will certainly face challenges. But irrespective of that, the point he is taking us, the readers, at is important which is, despite the political organization of that anger, and despite the fact that some of these political parties did achieve power, the political economy structure did not really change. Which means that in 2020, 12 years after the financial crisis, and according to the argument of this book, 25 years at least of the perpetuation of that political economy, that differentiates massively in the initial four socioeconomic points I highlighted between asset owners and non-asset owners, that situation remains as is, despite the waves of anger, despite the political organization of that anger, and despite the fact that some of the political parties that represented that anger have come to power. So the question that he poses at the end is, does that mean that now that anger will be dispersed? Or perhaps it will find a new expression that might not necessarily be in the ordinary political contestation as it did in the last decade. Of course, this question is alarmist because it could be rephrased. That the failure of that anger to effect change in the last decade means it could come back to express itself outside the political system, again on the street, but perhaps this time in a by far more assertive way.